So my story begins as a little girl in a household with two parents um, that were loving and safe. And we were in a mostly Christian household in a mostly suburban area. All good things. But when I was seven years old, unfortunately, my life took a turn. Um, my mom had a car accident that left her paralyzed from the neck down. Um, and that was just two short months after my new baby brother had been born. It was just me, him, my mom, and my dad. Um, during that time, I pretty much was living in a single dad household while my mom was recuperating in the hospital. Um, and because of that, we had a lot of loving family and friends that were moving in and out of the house in order to help my dad raise a newborn and me um, at seven years old. Um, but unfortunately, during that time, there was so much movement um, that I ended up getting molested from a family member. That started a pattern of trauma and abuse in my life that would take a huge toll and put up a huge wall. Um, at that time, shame kind of took over and it was a big secret. And so there was a wall between my parents and I um, that was created at that point. From then on, the pattern of abuse of boys and older guys in the neighborhood or in school, taking advantage of people not really watching me all the time. I, I remember even being 14 years old and there was this much older boy in my life that was telling me all the things that I wanted to hear. Like, I love you, I care for you, like, you're my ride or die, you know, we'll, I'll take you wherever I go. And that's all I wanted to hear. I just, I wanted to know that someone was in my corner no matter what. Um, and at that point in time, I didn't know to look to Jesus for that attention. And so I looked for it in all the wrong places. So all of my prepubescent, my puberty life, my teenage life, I continued this trajectory of of looking for attention and love um, from guys, from boys, um, wanting somebody to validate this thing that I had inside. Um, but thankfully, there were some people in my life, especially in church, um, that were kind of calling me into community, calling me um, to get closer to God. Um, so for a, a stint of my life, I was kind of in two worlds. I was the, the worshiper on the stage crying out, um, but I was also struggling with pornography addiction. I was struggling with um, boys sending me things that they did not need to send me and me sending things that I shouldn't have been sending either. Uh, although I was going to church, I was worshiping. I, I mean, I remember even being invited to like regional events where I was leading worship um, and crying out because I, I, I knew I needed I needed Jesus. Um, I was still in the secrecy and the shame behind that wall. I, I was still feeling utterly broken. I wanted the, the, the what, what is it? I wanted the knight in shining armor to kind of bust through my walls and to rescue me out of this, this brokenness that I felt, this loneliness that I felt. I could be surrounded by my family. I had a huge family that loved me um, but I was keeping up this huge wall where no one knew what was really going on behind closed doors. The rebellion that people saw was a product of all the pain on the inside, um, but I just wouldn't let anybody in. Uh, when I was 18, I finally built up like a smidgen of courage and I, I wanted to say something to my mom. And, you know, all the while, all these things are happening to me. Um, at church, I'm like, I'm this girl that is crying her eyes out on the altar every weekend. I, I was that girl that the altar call was like, you might as well have signed my name at the end because I was there every weekend. And so I was always there. I was also a worship leader. I was a youth leader. Like I, I was doing all these things um, and, and trying to kind of like, in my private life, I was looking for affection, love, attention. And then in my public life I was also doing the same thing and I was trying to find it from Jesus but I was doing it through works like I was trying to work my way to Jesus's love and affection um and so when I was 18 I found myself in this just this split personality 
you know, where I, in my private life, I'm, I'm having these conversations with boys that should not have been happening. I'm sending things that I shouldn't be. I'm seeing things that I shouldn't be. Um, and you know, with, with guys that had no business messaging me either. So, um, I finally kind of found myself at this, this, this point in my life where I was just like, I, I you need to tell somebody, um, what's going on with me. I need to open up. Um, so I, I, went to my mom and I, I told her like this little tiny piece. I mean, it was the tip of the iceberg of all the trauma, all the sin that I had buried deep, but she shared it with my dad and I couldn't handle that. And at, so at that point, there was just this huge explosion in me where I couldn't handle people seeing behind the wall. And I didn't know how to handle my dad knowing all these things. Um, my relationship with my dad had been rocky at best for years and years. Um, and so him knowing was just too much for me to handle. And I left. I left my house um, and I moved in with friends. I, I was on a, living on a waitress um, income. And so eventually uh, the need for money led me into the strip clubs. Um, the promise of quick cash is what called me in and and I just kept getting told you do this for free anyways why not get some money for it so through the strip clubs I was recruited um, and groomed by a trafficker or a trafficker's recruiter um, they told me there was this manager down in Miami listen you can make so much more money um, the, the money that you're making here in like a month, you're going to make in a weekend. And I was desperate for cash. I did not have money to live. And so I listened to this girl and I went down to Miami and it's a trafficker. And I'll, now all of a sudden, you know, my car is where he's at, not where I'm at. Um, my money is being held by him. You know, he's controlling how much I eat, um, controlling how much I sleep, essentially. Um, and being sexually assaulted constantly um, in order to keep me uh, docile. And my life just, it went from bad to worst. And the worst, I mean, it went to the worst that it could go. During that time that I was trafficked, I, it, it always shocks me to remember how Jesus was so relentlessly pursuing me. Um, he never stopped and all and all of my time just stuck within myself. He continued to kind of like throw rocks over the wall, um, trying to get my attention. And I remember being in the strip club and this random man came in and looked at me and he told me, you're not supposed to be here. And I, I just kind of stared at him and I'm like, oh, I don't know what you have to say here. And he said, Gee, like, I know you got Jesus all over you, and I know you used to be a singer. And I mean, he called me out by name. And um, I always remember <laughs> being really hungry. I was physically hungry um, because my trafficker was keeping me to one meal a day um, so that I was in the right weight limit um, for his, because I was a product. And um, that's what was easy to sell. So I started singing, and the song that would always end up coming out of me um, and I, it was just, it was Jesus and it, it's a Spanish worship song and it said, Tengo hambre de ti, de tu, fra de tu presencia, de tu fragancia y de tu poder. And it just means like, I have, I have a hunger for you, God. I'm hungry for your presence. I'm hungry for your fragrance. Um, I'm hungry for your power. And I would just sing it and I would know and feel that Jesus was calling me, but I just didn't know how to respond. And, um, Thankfully, throughout this process, uh, God gave me a way to escape. I, I ended up one morning um, getting a taxi to go to the hotel where my trafficker was at. And the other miracle is that I had my keys, although he had my car, and the trafficker was asleep. And just everything in me screamed, get in the car and go. And so I just, I got in my car, I called my uncle and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming back. Um, and he said, yeah, pick up my son so I can pay you, I'm gonna pay you the gas money to go. And I needed that gas money because all I had was $30 of cash that I had stuck into my visor to hide from my trafficker because he kept 
every penny that I earned um, being sold. And um, so I left with the clothes on my back and 30 bucks in my wallet and I left and I think I thank God for rescuing me out of that situation. My parents took me back graciously um, and helped me rebuild. And through that process, um, I'll never forget, you know, just finally deciding to go back to church. And it took it took a lot out of me to, to go to church because I just, I felt too ashamed. Um, and I didn't want for people to judge me. Um, but I just had a realization that I said, you know what, if I go back to church, I'm going on my own terms. I'm, I'm not doing this legalistic thing again. I, I'm not gonna do the whole, everybody seeing the girl on the outside that 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 is worshiping and then that is this, but then she's just broken on the inside. Like, I am just gonna be me. And if Jesus wants me, he'll take me like that. And, um, and Jesus took me up on my challenge and I showed up on my loose shirt and my leggies and Jesus took a hold of my heart that day. I, I just, I broke. And, and he talked about, you know, Jesus um, catching every tear that would fall. And I just needed, I needed to cry. I needed to be loved. Um, and, and when he expressed just the, the love of Jesus, my walls started breaking down. And I felt the love of God that day. Um, and I was never the same. Uh, my walls began to start to kind of crumble down. Um, it took a really long time for my walls to completely come down, but Jesus was so persistent and so loving and so caring and so patient with me because man, I'm hard-headed. Now I can stand on the other side and say, I'm saved, I'm loved, I am not broken. Um, I am a woman of God and all through his grace, all through his mercy, all through his love, and that continual pursuit, um, I can I cannot thank Jesus enough for never letting me go and for never giving up on me.